Very good morning to you and welcome to this worship service recorded at Rickmansworth Baptist Church. It's lovely that we can gather today to lift our praises to the Lord, to listen to the truths as they come from Scripture and to meet together and pray together. And so let's open our time, shall we, with prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great blessing that it is that we can gather together where we are, but still together, and lift your name up in praise and lift our prayers to you. We thank you, Lord, that it is a blessing that we are a church, that together we can be your church, and that together, because of you, we have power. So we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come amongst us today, wherever we are, that you would testify to us, speak to us, that we may proclaim your gospel into the world, wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our gospel reading today comes from John chapter 3, and I'm going to read to you from the second part of verse 13 through to 21. I forgot my glasses this morning, so do bear with me if I read quite slowly. No one has ever gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its saviour. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. In a moment we're going to lift our praises to the Lord. You'll be able to follow the words in the description below this video. To Jesus is Lord. So find those words and then we'll sing together. Shall own his name, Jesus. 
Well, we've been encouraging one another over the past couple of weeks to open our Bibles so we understand our faith, so we understand our Lord more. Last week, we tried to get to grips a little bit with understanding some of the things about God that we learned from Scripture. Now, specifically, we turn to one part of the Godhead, one part of the Trinity in Jesus Christ to see what we learn from Scripture about him. Well, first of all, it's really important for us to say, as Christians, that Jesus is God. Anything on the contrary would mean that we are not actually followers of anyone but a man. We are followers of our God, our mighty God. And we know that Jesus is God for several reasons when we open up our scriptures the first reason we know that Jesus is God is that he claimed to be God. He is decisive in what he says, so much so that when he was put on trial before the religious leaders, they decided that what he was saying was blasphemous because he was claiming equality with that of God. If you look at all the I am sayings in John's Gospel, you will see time and time again that Jesus is clearly stating who he is. And when he is put on trial, there is no doubt about who he is. He is, he is who he says he is, and he is God. Another thing that we pick up, this time looking at the actions of Jesus, is that Jesus displayed for everyone to see that he had God's authority. He had the authority to forgive sins. You remember that that was seen as blasphemous. Who has authority to forgive sins, they said, except for God? Proof that if he has the authority to forgive sins, then his authority is God's. The people who condemned him said it themselves. He has the authority to judge men, we hear. He has the authority to raise men from the dead. We see the example of this as he raises Lazarus from the dead in Scripture. No one could do these things except for God. God can forgive. God can judge. God can raise people to life. No one else can do that. God can do it. Proof that Jesus is God. We spoke about God's attributes last week. Well, we see Jesus demonstrate these attributes himself. He claimed omnipotence. We see this in scripture. He demonstrated power over nature. He demonstrated power over physical disease, over demons, over death. We see through the life that Jesus lived, through the miracles he performed, through the interactions that he had, through the driving out of demons, through the forgiveness of th sins, through all he did, that he is demonstrating the attributes that only God has. Proof that Jesus is God. Not only did people look to Jesus and see the wonderful things he did and listen to the wonderful things that he said but after Jesus' earthly life also we see that others wrote about Jesus they wrote about who he is who he says he is and what he actually is in their opinion when we open John's Gospel immediately we come to this wonderful prologue that describes exactly who Jesus is. He is the one who was there with the Father when all things began. As we look through writings of scripture by human hand, we see them writing about who Jesus is 
and saying that he is God. Jesus was referenced by biblical authors that he is the same as the eternal creator. So if we can look to scripture and we can see proof that Jesus is God, what about something else that people deny sometimes of Jesus? That is that he was fully human. Is there proof that Jesus is fully human in scripture? Can we see it there in scripture for ourselves? Well, we see uh, as we, we form an image of Jesus that's painted with the words in scripture from his birth through his life that he is somebody who had a body, a soul and a spirit and he shared our physical, emotional experiences. It seems evident through scripture that this is the case. He experienced fatigue. He would need to go and refresh himself by spending time with the Father and he would go off in prayer. In, in prayer. We hear, don't we, that he struggled with hunger and thirst as he went into the wilderness. Very human experiences. We hear that he experienced anger when he walked into the temple courts and he, he saw people doing things that they shouldn't have been doing in the house of God. We see that he gets angry and frustrated throughout scripture at the lack of understanding of the message that he's trying to give. We can see in the garden of Gethsemane as he is on his knees praying that he is very human. When he's facing the reality of death, he is fearful, as we would be scared. Not because we don't understand that there's um, a hope of heaven for us, that there is eternity, but it's the fear, isn't it, of that which confronts us. The fear of suffering. That was very real for Jesus too. So much so that he sweated droplets of blood. He was so anxious, so overcome. So we know from scripture and we see from scripture that Jesus was somebody who is very human. Yes, he is very God, but he is also very human. His humanity is there for us all to see. He had a natural birth, he had a death, and he experienced everything else that every other human would go through themselves. So why does it matter then that we deduce and prove that Jesus is fully human? Well, if you think about it, Jesus needed to be fully human if he was to atone for the sins of the world. If he were not fully human, he wouldn't be able to take our place on the cross. He wouldn't be able to take the punishment for us in that atoning sacrifice, if he were just deity. Seems strange to say that, just God. He had to be more than God to bridge that gap. He had to be human so he could stand in our place. He also had to be human so that he could stand to be our high priest. The scripture is very clear in its prophecies that Jesus would fulfill the role of prophet, priest and king. If he was to be the priest, he would need to be human. It was a human role and it's the role of an interceder between God and humankind. Jesus needed to be human to do that. And having gone through the human experience, we can see that Jesus is fully able to understand and sympathise with our plight. And he's able to do something about it because he lived perfectly as a human. And there are many heresies that crept up in the, in the relatively early church and are still alive and well in the church today about who exactly Jesus is. Some claim that he is not God, only a, a really holy human being. Some say that 
actually he is completely God, so much so that it absorbed any humanity that he could have. Both those things are incorrect. The, the writers of scripture go to great lengths to show us how Jesus is both 100% God and 100% human. And it's incredibly important that we don't ignore this. But as I stated just a moment ago, Jesus is different to us, not just in his deity, but also in his humanity, in that Jesus is perfect in his humanity. So Jesus is perfect as we would expect in his deity, but he is also perfect in his humanity, and that makes him unique compared to any other human that has ever walked the earth. Why is it important that we understand and believe that he is perfect though? Well firstly, it allowed him to be the sacrificial lamb by which sin is offered. The Old Testament law depicts and shows that the animal that is being sacrificed for sin must be pure blameless. If Jesus is the lamb above all lambs, if he is the ultimate lamb to take away the sin of the world for all time, he needed to be pure and holy for that to do the job. Also, him being perfect and living a perfect life gives us a wonderful example of what we should follow in our lives, of obedience to God, of not picking and choosing, but of striving to be the very best we can. Jesus obeyed every law that God had put before humankind because it is the best way to live, the best way to be. We are to follow Jesus' example, not Adam's example. Obedience versus disobedience. Jesus is described as being the second Adam, the new Adam, the last Adam. He shows for us what can happen through obedience. Whereas as we look all around us in the world, we see the consequences of the disobedience that came through Adam. And finally, why must Jesus be perfect? Because only if you are without sin can you approach the throne of the Father. And Jesus, as the high priest, is the way to the Father. And as the high priest, he is able to intercede on our behalf for the sins of the people. If he were not blameless, if he were not pure, he would not be able to approach the Father's throne. Another thing that people often dispute when they look at Jesus is his resurrection. I've heard people say maybe it was more of a resuscitation, maybe it wasn't a literal resurrection. We must understand that these things are false. If we follow the true and biblical Jesus, it's really important that we understand that Jesus was a, a, a physical, resurrected Jesus. Several pieces of evidence are there in Scripture for us, and I won't go over all of these now. But suffice to say, there are sufficient eyewitness accounts through Scripture, sufficient numbers of people who would want to tell you the truth about Jesus for various different reasons. There are the Jewish authorities who would want to be able to categorically say that Jesus hadn't risen from the dead and dispel that. There were the guards on the tomb who could have easily dispelled it. There were those um, eyewitnesses who were not who you would hand-pick to be eyewitnesses. The accounts of women were, were not regarded as being as verifiable as the accounts of men. And yet we see that throughout 
um, our gospel, what we read, is there are so many eyewitnesses, so many people who experience the risen Christ and their lives are changed and transformed and history is transformed as a result that his resurrection, it cannot be denied. And if you want to read more about this, I really recommend to you The Case for Christ um, as a book by Lee Strobel. It's a wonderful account of um, Jesus' resurrection and the proof that is out there that is impossible to deny. The resurrection happened and it formed part of the biblical Jesus about who he is. But what does it matter? What does it matter that the resurrection is true? Jesus would have been a good man still. He could have done all the things that he did in his earthly life before. What, what, what does it matter that the resurrection happened? Well, it does make a real difference, actually. First, it confirms the truth and the validity of what Jesus taught. It testifies to who he is and therefore we can't just accuse him of being misguided or, or being a, a liar or a thief if we were being more malicious about it. It confirms exactly who scriptures say he is, that he was able to vic be a victor over death. Paul tells us that without the resurrection, faith is futile. That couldn't be further from it couldn't be more truthful. Second, understanding that Jesus is resurrected gives us um, assuredness that we too will experience a resurrection. We have those assurances that physical death for us is not the end because we look to Jesus and we know that because he lives, we will live also. And it assures us that the power that we have is real power. If you think of the power that any individual on earth has, the most powerful person that has ever lived, that ends at the point that they die. So the power of somebody who is still living is always more powerful than somebody who is dead. In Jesus, there is living power because he is still living. And that could only be the case if we believe in the resurrection. Now Jesus also ascended into heaven, the Bible tells us. And this is incredibly important for us to understand. Because Jesus has access to God. That's a fundamental belief. We believe that he is um, our intercessor. He intercedes on our behalf to the Father. If he didn't ascend to heaven then it would be evidence, wouldn't it, that there wasn't access to the Father through the Son. But because of the ascension, we can see very clearly that there is access from the Son through him to the Father. And what I want to encourage you today is to remember that fact. Remember that there is access to the Father because we have an interceder on our behalf. Jesus, the priest, the high priest, who makes intercession on our behalf. When we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray that because in that there is authority and in Jesus' name there is access to the Father. Take advantage of that gift that is freely given by Jesus, access to God the Father through him. You know, I really don't think we use that enough. If we really believe we have access to the Father in heaven through Jesus the Son, we'll be saying his name all the time. Each and every situation we're in, we'll be saying in Jesus' name, give it over to in Jesus' name. We pray for God's influence. What wonderful access we have through Jesus because of who Jesus is. So if someone was to come and ask you about who Jesus is, I wonder how you'd put it across. Maybe you'd say something like this. 
Jesus is God incarnate. God himself came down to earth in human form so that he may redeem and save us from sin. Jesus was both fully God and fully man. We cannot add to or remove from his deity or from his human nature. During his life on earth, Jesus lived a perfect, blameless life so that he could be a perfect sacrifice to atone for the sins of the world. Yet he also experienced human emotions such as sadness and anxiety. The reason that we as Christians believe in Christ is not only because through him we are cleansed from sin and have a relationship with God the Father, but Jesus also said that this was possible. Through his bodily resurrection, he validated and affirmed all his teachings on earth and proved that he is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, as Jesus has ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, he acts as our high priest and heavenly advocate, allowing us to approach and be his full partner and be in his full presence. He doesn't call us servants, friends. He calls us friends. Scripture tells us exactly who Jesus is. He is exactly who he says he is. His name has power and authority and access to the Father. Follow the biblical Jesus today. Amen. Well, as we think upon Jesus and who he says he is, let us sing together. How you can follow the words again in the description. Lord, for the years, your love has kept and guided. Oh, no.
don't know about you, but I found this to be a more difficult week uh, in lockdown. It seems like it's gone on quite some time and we're probably, what about halfway through it now, I think. So I do want to pray um, for strength for us all as we continue to negotiate the couple of weeks that we have ahead and um, we hope that that will be then the conclusion of the lockdown and that life will be a bit more normal after that. But there's so much anxiety, isn't there, of the unknown. Uh, but we are grateful that we know that Jesus has walked where we walk. Um, he experienced anxiety in his life, fully in his humanity. And so we have a God who understands, who sympathises, and a God who we can come to in prayer. So let us say a short prayer for all of us in our own situations. Let us pray. Our loving Lord and Heavenly Father, you know us so well. You have indeed walked the earth in your humanity, experiencing hardship, pain, suffering. And so as we come to you in our prayers, we know that you are a God who does sympathise, but also a God who intercedes on our behalf. So where we feel loneliness, where we feel anxiety, where we feel depressed, when we feel that there's no hope, we look to you, Lord, and we ask for your peace. We look to you for hope. You are the hope of all the nations, Lord. In you, all things are possible. And so in our individual situations, however we find ourselves today, we proclaim you as Lord over our lives. We trust in you and we embrace the peace that you bring. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let us pray now together those words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.